Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime video. And before we jump into today's case, I want to talk about today's sponsor and that is Sun Soil CBD. Now you guys know I have been a huge advocate for CBD for a lot of years now on my channel and I am so happy that I found Sun Soil. I absolutely adore their products. Sun Soil is a CBD company that is based out of Vermont. Now the cool thing about Sun Soil is it makes CBD oil that is USDA certified organic. CBD is made from hemp plants, so how the hemp is grown really does matter when it comes to CBD, and that's why I really like Sun Soil, because they never use any pesticides, herbicides, or any GMOs. I feel like as I'm getting older, I'm only 23, but I feel like I'm 50 sometimes. As I'm getting older, I really am becoming more cautious of what I put on and in my body, and that's why I really like Sun Soil, because it's made from simple ingredients. Sun Soil also donates a percentage of sales via 1% for the planet to environmental and community causes. So when you're purchasing sun soil, a percentage of those sales is being put back into the community, which I also really like. Personally, I love their coconut oil. I also love their drops. They have chocolate mint drops, which are so cool. I love how creative their flavors are. And I also really enjoy their capsules as well, their soft gels. Sun soil makes CBD oil with simple organic ingredients. So if you want to get 30% off your first order of sun soil, all you have to do is go to sunsoil.com slash killer. Again, that is just sunsoil.com slash killer, S-U-N-S-O-I-L.com slash killer. And you will get 30% off your first order. So thank you, Sun Soil, for sponsoring this. And now let's move on into today's case. So today's case, I feel like this week's case and last week's case are kind of following a specific theme. And that theme is female offenders. And I always find cases that have female offenders very intriguing because it's not something that you see very often. Typically, we deal with cases where the offenders are male. So to see a female offender isn't something that you really see every day. And this case is definitely not something that you see every day. Today, we are talking about Sheila Labar. Sheila is presumed to be a female serial killer. So let's get into it. So this is Sheila. Sheila was born on July 4th, 1958, and her maiden name was Sheila K. Bailey. Sheila was born in Alabama and she also has a sister named Lynn. In 1976, Sheila graduated from Fort Payne High School and her nickname growing up was Firecracker. That was what she was called by, by her family and friends, and it definitely reflected her personality to a T. Sheila was also described to be very charming and she was very smart. She was described to be very manipulative. Sheila was the type of person that knew how to get what she wanted. She knew how to work the system. She knew how to work any person into getting what she wanted. And she typically always did. She stopped at no lengths to get what she wanted. So Sheila has been married multiple times. She got married to her first husband, which is a man named Ronnie Jennings. Now, after being married to Ronnie for a couple years, Sheila realized that this relationship was not working out. So she wanted to get a divorce. However, when she approached Ronnie with this, Ronnie basically told told her that that was not gonna happen, that they were not going to get a divorce, and he refused to divorce her for some time. However, ultimately, he came to the realization that this couldn't go on any longer either, so they ended up filing for divorce. Now, at this time in the early 1980s, Sheila's mental health was not doing the best, and she actually got admitted to a psychiatric facility after she had attempted suicide. Sheila did not have the best experience at this facility either. She claimed that she was sexually assaulted by by one of the employees at the facility. Now, after leaving the psychiatric facility is when she went on to marry a man named John Baxter. Now, the two of them got married in 1981. However, that marriage didn't end up lasting either. So now we move on to 1987. And this is when Sheila ended up moving to a town called Epping, New Hampshire. Now, Epping is a fairly small community with a population of about 5,000 people. And that was in 1990 is when there was 5,000 people. And it's a town known for its historic architecture. And overall, it's just a very quaint and cute town. And it's located in Rockingham County. But there was a particular reason Sheila went to Epping. It wasn't just an off the whim decision. It was very calculated. Sheila ended up moving to Epping after she answered a personal ad from a man named Wilfred Labar. Now, Wilfred was a chiropractor who was extremely well 
well liked in the community and he also made a decent amount of money. Wilfred owned one of the largest pieces of real estate in Epping and his house stood on an 115 acre horse farm. So he had a lot of land that he was dealing with. Now Wilfred seemed to have everything going for him in life. He had a great house, he had a great job, but the one thing that he was missing in his life was a partner and a companion. And that is where Sheila comes into the picture. Now Sheila was actually 34 years younger than Wilfred when the two of them got together, but that did not stop them from forming a romantic relationship. Wilfred was really looking for someone who could show him affection and really be his companion, and Sheila fit that role to a T for him. People who knew Wilfred said that he really just got swept off of his feet by Sheila because she was young and attractive and she liked him. Regardless of the underlying reasons, she played the part pretty well and Wilfred really just fell head over heels for her. Now Sheila definitely made her presence known when she moved to Epping. She made everyone call her Mrs. Labar, even though she was actually not legally married to Wilfred. The two of them just said that they were married, but they weren't actually married. Now, while the two of them were together, Sheila lived in Wilfred's house with him. And over time, everything that Wilfred owned slowly over time became Sheila's. Now, Wilfred actually ended up passing away in the year 2000 when he was 74 years old. So Sheila and Wilfred were together from 1987. And when it came to Wilfred's death, he mysteriously passed away from a heart attack. Now, a lot of people had a lot of speculations about Wilfred's death because for the most part, he seemed like a very healthy guy. And Wilfred did have children from his previous relationships. However, basically everything that he owned was inherited by Sheila. And Sheila basically defended this by saying that she was his common law wife. Now you would think you just lost your partner, the person you're calling your husband. You would be very distraught over this and you would be very upset. However, that wasn't the case for Sheila. Sheila actually seemed fairly unbothered by Wilfred's death. She continued on with her life in Epping, New Hampshire and lived in the house that Wilfred owned. And in 2006, Sheila ended up meeting another man. She ended up meeting a man named Kenneth County. Kenneth also goes by Kenny and that's what I'm going to be referring to him as in this video. Now, Kenny was 24 years old when he met Sheila, which by the way, was half of Sheila's age because at this point, Sheila was now 48 years old. Now, Sheila and Kenny's relationship was very, very physical in the beginning and it heated up very quickly. What they would do is they would just hang out, drink, and hook up. That was kind of their routine. And over time, they formed a more romantic relationship than just a sexual one. And this is where the description that we gave earlier about Sheila being manipulative and knowing how to get what she wants comes into play. Because once the two of them got together officially, Sheila made it her sole mission to completely isolate Kenny from his family and his friends and everyone that knew him. And she really did succeed in this. Shortly after meeting Sheila, Kenny ended up moving in with her into the house that was Wilfred's. And Sheila did such a good job at isolating Kenny that he ended up not answering any of his mother's phone calls for weeks on end. And according to Kenny's mother, she said that this was really, really unlike him. So she ended up contacting authorities to file a missing persons report because she didn't know what had happened to her son at this point. She hadn't heard from him at all and she was getting really worried. So Kenny's mom filed a missing persons report and told authorities that the last time she had seen Kenny was when he said that he was going to meet someone whose name started with an S. It was a woman whose name started with an S and she drove a black Cadillac. Now, just based off of that description, authorities basically knew who this was. They knew it was Sheila. Again, Epping is a small town. Wilfred was well known. They pretty much knew who Kenny was with at this time. So that is when two police officers went to Sheila's home to do a welfare check on Kenny. Now when police got to the house and knocked on the door, Kenny actually answered. So Kenny answered the door and said that everything was fine, that he was good, he was living there with Sheila, and that there was really nothing to be worried about. So because police physically saw him and physically knew that he was okay, and Kenny was saying that he was okay, and he didn't seem like he was in any immediate danger, police knew that there was really nothing that they could do. Kenny was a 24-year-old man. He can make his own decisions. He's 
he's legally an adult. If he doesn't want to talk to his family, he doesn't have to. If he wants to fall off the grid, he can do that too. So their hands were really tied at this point. There was nothing for them to really be able to do. And it was at this time that authorities learned something else about Kenny. Now, even though Kenny was a 24 year old man, he had developed mental issues, meaning that even though he was 24, he had an IQ of a 12 year old. So even though he legally was an adult, he was 24 years old, his IQ was that of a 12 year old, which by the way, is an example of the fact that Sheila is preying on vulnerable men, men that she knows that she can take advantage of. Kenny has the IQ of a 12 year old, but again, because he is 24, cops still couldn't do anything about it. They can't force him to leave if he doesn't want to. So that was really frustrating for Kenny's mom in particular, because she knew that this something just wasn't right here. Now, not too long after authorities went to go see Kenny at Sheila's home, they ended up running into Kenny at a local Walmart and he was with Sheila at the time and he was in one of those wheelchairs that grocery stores and places offer to make it easier for people who need wheelchair access to navigate around the store. You guys have probably seen them and Kenny was seen sitting in one of these wheelchairs. Now this was a little off-putting because Kenny did not use a wheelchair. Kenny could walk and I actually found a picture of Kenny at this Walmart. Why this picture was taken I'm not necessarily sure but there is a picture of Kenny sitting in this wheelchair at the Walmart. Now, according to police, they said when they saw Kenny there, he didn't look well. He had bruises on his skin and his skin was looking kind of ashy and he was looking kind of gray and authorities went up to him. They took this as an opportunity to walk up to him and ask if he was okay and see if everything was good. And Kenny actually refused to talk to the authorities. He did not want to speak with them. And Sheila was at the Walmart with Kenny as well. And authorities just kind of stood back and watched as this whole interaction went down and they saw that Sheila was purchasing empty gas tanks. As you can tell in the picture, I'll pop it up again right here. These yellow things are empty gas tanks and they thought it was a little strange. Authorities thought it was strange, but they didn't say anything about it. Now, about five days later after this Walmart interaction, authorities actually got a phone call from Sheila. Now, Sheila told authorities that Kenny was no longer staying with her, that he left to go back home. And she also told police that Kenny was a pedophile. She said that Kenny was a pedophile and she had a audio tape to prove that he was a pedophile. Now, obviously authorities hearing that someone is a pedophile and that there's proof for it, they wanted to hear it. So they asked Sheila to play the tape. But this tape that Sheila played had absolutely nothing to do with Kenny being a pedophile. Police said that the tape that Sheila played was an audio recording where you could hear Sheila asking Kenny, why are you throwing up? Stop throwing up. And then she went on to continue to say, why are you passing out? Why did you pass out? So this was definitely off-putting for police because one, this has absolutely nothing to do with Kenny being a potential pedophile, and two, police really didn't know what to do with this and what to make of this. However, it was shortly after hearing this phone call that Kenny's mom actually reached out to the authorities and told them that Kenny actually never came home. And it was at that point that authorities knew that something was wrong. So now with this new piece of information that Kenny never ended up making it home, police thought that the best thing to do now would be to take a trip over to Sheila's house to do a second welfare check and just kind of see what the deal was. See if Kenny was there. They now have this weird audio tape situation. So they ended up going to Sheila's house and they got there at about 6 o'clock p.m. And that is when they saw a large burn pile in the front yard of the house. Now when this was spotted, an officer said he walked over to the burn pile and he moved a log with his foot. And when he did that, he said that he noticed a piece of human flesh 
on the ground. Along with that, he said that he also spotted a piece of a human bone. He said that it looked to be more specifically an upper arm bone. Now, when police saw this, they automatically went up to Sheila's front door and started knocking on it. And that is when Sheila opened the door and was very inviting initially. She invited authorities inside. And this is when authorities were shocked when they walked in to see what they saw. Because something to know about Wilfred, when Sheila first moved in, Wilfred kept his house very tidy it was spotless it was very organized and when authorities walked into Sheila's home it was a absolute disaster Sheila had multiple rabbits like she had bunnies like as pets and when I say multiple I don't mean like one or two two or three I'm talking about hundreds authorities said she had hundreds of rabbits and they were just free free to roam around the house wherever they were hopping around everywhere authorities said that there was a terrible smell coming from inside of the home that probably had something to do with the rabbits there was rotten food left in the sink and overall the house was just a disaster that's just what the situation was and when authorities were walking around they noticed a pair of kenny's shoes that were in the living room and authorities asked sheila like oh why are kenny's shoes here and sheila ended up telling them that these were a pair of shoes that sheila had bought kenny so when he left he left them there because she had purchased them essentially authorities thought that this was a pretty valid answer they didn't really question it and they continued to walk through the house and that is when sheila ended up bringing them down to the basement so they could check out that part of the house as well now when they walked down into the basement they saw another pair of Kenny's shoes. Now these ones were noticeably new. They were on top of a shoe box. They looked spotless. So authorities asked Sheila again, like if these are the new shoes, cause clearly these ones were the new ones and the ones upstairs were not new. What shoes did Kenny wear when he left the home? To this question, Sheila did not have an answer. She kind of dug herself into this lie and she knew authorities kind of trapped her into a lie. And she knew that she couldn't answer it in a way that would make it seem logical. So she actually ended up telling authorities that they had to leave. They couldn't look through the house anymore. And if they wanted to come back, they would have to have a search warrant. So because of that, police ended up leaving the home. Now, when they left, they said that after just that small interaction, they were pretty much convinced that Sheila definitely had something to do with Kenny's disappearance and more than likely had murdered him. So authorities were actually able to get this warrant fairly quickly because the next day they went back with a search warrant to search through the entire property. Now when authorities pulled up, they actually saw Sheila. She was in the front yard at the burn pile that they had saw the day prior and she was just rubbing in all of the ashes into the ground. She was moving things around almost as if she was trying to make it seem that that was not there and that wasn't a thing or that it wasn't there the day prior. But obviously when police rolled up at the time that she was doing that, it looked way more suspicious because now she's in there like trying to get rid of all of the evidence that was there the day prior. And to this day, authorities said that when they went back into that burn pile, the piece of flesh was gone as well as the bone. However, they were able to find tiny pieces of bone fragments left inside of the ashes that they were able to test for DNA. So authorities are now searching this entire property, 115 acres authorities are searching. And they also went and searched through the septic tank. Now, when they searched through the septic tank, they found a birth certificate of a man named Michael Delage. Now, Michael Delage's name had never come up up until this point. Authorities didn't even know who this was. So when they found this, it brought forward a whole new list of questions. Who is Michael Delage? Why is his birth certificate in the septic tank? So now all of these new questions that police had, they had to find answers to. So authorities soon figured out that Sheila had actually flushed this birth certificate of Michael Delage down the toilet as well as several other pieces of evidence. So who is Michael Delage? 
Well, there was actually never a missing persons report filed for Michael, which is why no one really ever knew that he was missing. Michael was estranged from his family and had been staying in a homeless shelter at the time that he met Sheila. The two of them met shortly after Wilfred had passed away, so this was after Wilfred and before Kenny, and Sheila used his vulnerability again to her complete advantage. She basically offered Michael a place to stay at the house while he upkept the farm. She told him that she had 115 acres of farmland that she herself could not keep up with, so she needed someone to help her out with it. And Michael, being in and out of homeless shelters, saw this as a great opportunity. He had a place to live, he had food, he had all of these things that he didn't have before, and it looked like a really good opportunity for him, so he obviously jumped on this right away. Now, similar to her relationship with Kenny, her relationship with Michael soon became strictly romantic. They started dating. Now, Epping is the type of town where everyone knows everyone. Everyone's kind of in each other's business, knows what's going on with everyone, and when the word got out about Michael and the birth certificate being found in the septic tank, multiple witnesses came forward and stated that they saw Michael at Sheila's home. Now, one witness in particular said that on a winter day, so it was snowing outside, on a winter day, they saw Michael walking down Sheila's driveway. Sheila had this giant driveway. And for whatever reason, this person actually ended up passing Michael as he was walking. He had his head down and he was just walking straight, but he had a giant cut on his head and there was blood gushing from this cut on his head. So the person driving pulled over and asked if he was okay and what happened to him. And Michael did not say a single word. He kept walking and the only thing he said in response to this person asking what happened to him was Sheila. Now, while police were waiting for the DNA results to come back after they searched the home, as well as the DNA results from the burn pile, Sheila was supposed to be on watch. However, for whatever reason, she found a way to skip town. One way or another, Sheila was able to pack up herself and her rabbits and leave Epping. And she ended up heading over to Massachusetts. She also ended up dyeing her hair red to be less recognizable, and she withdrew thousands of dollars in cash. Now, while she was on the run, the DNA results came back and it was concluded that the DNA that was found in the burn pile matched the DNA of Kenny County. So at this point, Sheila is now a wanted person for first degree murder and police are trying to track her down. Now, 30 miles away in a town called Manchester, Sheila, for whatever reason, thought that she needed to drop off her rabbits at a local pet store in Manchester. So one night, she pulled off to this local pet store and asked the employees at the pet store if they would watch her rabbits for her for a couple days. She didn't give an explanation as to why. She just asked if they could watch her rabbits, to which the employees said, sure, no problem. And they also actually invited her to spend the night with them. That way she would have a place to stay for the night. And Sheila accepted this offer. So that night, Sheila and the employees went back to the employee's apartment with the rabbits and they were all playing with with the rabbits on the floor and they had the TV on. Now the TV was set to the news channel. So while they were all sitting there playing with these rabbits, the story of Sheila came up on the news. It said that she was wanted for first degree murder, that she was on the run, and these pet store employees are now sitting in their apartment playing with these rabbits with a person who's wanted for first degree murder. Now at this point, Sheila's cover is completely blown. The employees of the pet store contact the authorities and on April 2nd, 2006, Sheila was arrested for the murder of Kenny County. Now it is after her arrest that the DNA results came back from inside of the home and it shows that DNA of Michael was also inside of the house. Now, Michael's body was never discovered, but at the same time, Kenny's body was also never discovered, but it was shown that his bone fragments were found in the burn pile. So whatever Sheila ended up doing to Kenny, regardless of how he died, she ended up burning him to get rid of his remains. And authorities believe because of the circumstances, she most likely did the same thing to Michael. So because of the circumstances, she not only now is being charged with the murder of Kenny, but she's also being charged with the murder of Michael Delage. And instead of pleading not guilty and trying to fight this, Sheila actually ends up admitting 
to killing Kenny and Michael. But she said she had a reason as to why she did it, and she tried to justify it by saying that Kenny and Michael were both pedophiles. And she said the reason that she killed them was because it was her job to get rid of all of the pedophiles. She said that this is what she was born to do, was to get rid of all the pedophiles, and that she was doing a good thing. Remember that audio tape that Sheila took of Kenny basically saying, why are you throwing up? Why are you passing out? In that audio tape, she basically was trying to coerce Kenny into telling her that he was a pedophile, to which he did not admit to. Now, Sheila also took a tape of Michael, and instead of it being an audio tape, this was an actual videotape. And this videotape was played for the jury. And it was a similar thing. She was basically trying to coerce Michael into telling her that he was a pedophile, but he did not admit to it. Which again, I want to point out, there is no evidence that proves that Kenny or Michael was a pedophile. That is not what was going on here. Now, something else really interesting came out during the trial. During the trial, one of Sheila's ex-husbands actually came forward and said that Sheila had asked him to murder Wilfred for her, which brings a whole other question of, did Wilfred really die of a heart attack? Or was this all a plan that Sheila had in order to inherit everything he had? Now, Sheila's defense team did try to plead insanity. They tried to plead insanity that way she would not be fit to sit trial. However, this was denied. She was not deemed insane. And after a five week trial, Sheila was found guilty of two counts of murder and was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. Sheila did try to appeal her case in 2010. However, it was rejected. And she is currently serving her life sentence at the Homestead Correctional Institution in Florida City, Florida. Now I want to talk about what we said in the beginning, how she is a presumed serial killer, because to be a serial killer, the definition is you have to have murdered three people. That is the definition of a serial killer. But here, as we've just gone over, Sheila only admitted to murdering two people. Now, Wilfred is a possibility, but authorities believe that there are many, many more victims of Sheila out there. And this thought of theirs was confirmed when several months after the trial, authorities were back at Wilfred's home, the one that Sheila was staying at, and they were cleaning out everything. And when they went into the barn to clean out the barn, they found a set of human toes inside of the barn. Now these toes were sent off for testing and that is when it was discovered that they weren't a match for neither Kenny nor Michael. So these set of toes belong to someone completely different. So because of this discovery, authorities believe that this just kind of confirms the theory that Sheila did have at least one more murder victim. However, they believe that Sheila's victim count is way higher than that. And also think about it, if, if she didn't and she just cut off someone's toes, it's not like they're not gonna report that. It's not like they're not gonna say, this woman cut off my feet. Like it's this just wouldn't happen. Now during the investigation, there were people who came forward and said that there were other men who stayed at the house. There were other men who dated Sheila, countless other men. Because remember, she had six years until she met Kenny. So once Wilfred died in the year 2000 to when she met Kenny in 2006, which is when everything kind of began to unravel for her. She had six years of a dating history that no one really knows about other than Michael. But there are other witnesses who said that they've seen multiple men inside of that house. Also during the investigation, police found hundreds of hours of audio footage of Sheila speaking to different men on chat lines. So do we know exactly who this third victim is? No. Will we ever know exactly who this third victim is? Probably not. Will we know about any of the other potential victims of Sheila? Probably not, but I'm really interested to see what you guys think about this Like do you think that there are a lot more victims out there and it's very clear what Sheila was doing Sheila knew exactly how to get what she wanted and she preyed on people who were vulnerable She was very calculated. These men were not victims of opportunity They were completely sought after and carefully picked by Sheila. She knew exactly what she was doing So let me know what you guys think about this case in the comments below I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about it and with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime video here on my YouTube channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah. I make videos three days a week, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. You should subscribe and join the family. I love you guys so much, and I'll be back in a couple of days with a brand new one. Bye, guys.